Hi, I'm Ali McDonald. I'm an assistant editor at O'Reilly Media, and today I'm talking with Neil Ford, who's director, software architect, and meme wrangler at ThoughtWorks. He's also an O'Reilly author. Thank you for joining me today, Neil. You're welcome. Happy to be here. So we're talking about polyglot programming. Back in 2006, you wrote a blog post about polyglot programming that generated a lot of interest and momentum within the community, and I'm just interested in talking to you about it. Could you define polyglot programming for those who might be unfamiliar with the term? Absolutely. So back in 2006, just as one of my little observational blog entries I wrote, it's like three paragraphs, it's not a very long thing, but it was an observation that I made in 2006 that there were so many new languages on the JVM that it's becoming more and more common to actually mix and match languages running on the same platform rather than trying to force everything into one true language, which I think uh, we've tried to do for about a decade, trying to cram every problem into Java or every problem into C Sharp. And it was really this realization that when you have this really nice separation like Java has between language and runtime, then it frees you to use whatever language is most suitable for the problem. And so my observation was back then there was more than 100 languages that ran on the JVM. Maybe we should stop trying to invent a framework to solve every problem on top of Java and look at are some languages more suitable for certain kinds and shapes of problems than other kinds of languages? And I think that's, uh, I think it was true then, and I think it's even more true now. Great. Well, you've kind of touched on a little bit of the advantages, but what, what would you say are the main advantages of poly polyglot programming? The main advantage is just using a, a tool that is more keenly shaped to the job you're trying to perform. So I'll give a, one of my examples is that Java is fantastic for doing lots of things, but it's, in my opinion, terrible for building user interfaces. Because you look at something like Sling, the constraints that are built into Java, like the static typing and the, the, the force you have to declare everything before you use it, that's really cumbersome if you're trying to build something where, uh, you know, you don't, the rigor of having all those declarations in place is not nearly so important if you're building something really flexible like a user interface. And I realized, well, you know, there are great domain-specific languages built on top of Groovy called Swing Builder that make building Swing UIs much easier. There's a, a library on top of Ruby called Swibby that makes it really easy to build Swing applications. Why are you banging your head against Java uh, when there are easier ways to do this? And you don't pay the penalty you used to pay for having multiple languages and product and projects because that used to mean mixing platforms, and that's always cumbersome because you've got messaging or you know, mixing Java and .NET now is cumbersome. Mixing platforms is always cumbersome, but you're all running on the same platform, and so it's really just the way you're expressing ideas. And so the, the kind of example I give is that there's no reason to give up the Java code that you have that talks to a mainframe or has some useful business logic that you already have, but maybe you need a really, uh, really complex multi-thread scheduling algorithm. And that, that'd be much easier to write in a language like Scala or Clojure. And you need to build rich user interfaces, which is much easier in a Ruby or Groovy. Why not mix and match and, and, and use the strengths of each one of those things? I think that's, that becomes a huge advantage. And it's, it's just beating your head against uh, fewer invented problems. So another one of the, uh, uh, a very polyglot thing that I recommend for people, another practical advantage for it is something like don't write unit tests for Java code in Java. You can write those unit tests in something like Groovy. Groovy makes it really easy to test Java code. It has mocking built in, which you have to have elaborate frameworks to do this in Java. It automatically ignores private so that you can do test-driven development even on private methods in Java and never have to jump through reflection hoops or anything like that. So just easing the friction that are, that's imposed in many cases artificially because you're using the wrong kind of screwdriver to try to screw something in, finding a better screwdriver a lot of times makes you much more effective and, and removes a lot of friction from your job. And you can get things done much more quickly and save time and money and all those other fantastic things. That's great. Yeah, it sounds like it gives teams a lot more flexibility. And something I found interesting is that in The Productive Programmer, which you wrote for us back in 2008, um, you have a chapter devoted to polyglot programming, and in it you wrote that software development was going to look a lot different in five years. So now, five years down the road, um, how would you say polyglot programming has impacted software development? Has it evolved in any ways that you didn't anticipate? 
Well, that's, you know, it's always dangerous to make predictions about things because people always bring them back to you. Exactly. <laughs> and unfortunately, this time, I think I was pretty close. So that's, that's the unusual outcome of a prediction is that this, this one seems pretty, uh, running pretty much apace. Um, most of our projects now are polyglot in one form or another, uh, whether it's, you know, in a small way or a big way. ThoughtWorks Studios, there's a small commercial tool division of ThoughtWorks, and all of their tools are polyglot, you know, using the right things, the right tools for the job. So I think that's really, really common. It's much more common than not. I would not say that every project is taking advantage of this now, but it's uh, – it, every project is that you just don't quite realize it because now – if you're using something like Gradle for your builds, for example, in a Java project, well, that's Groovy. So now you're Java and Groovy, and you've got JavaScript, too. So, oh, and you've got SQL in your project, too. So, you know, there are a lot of languages running around. CSS is another language that's common in your project. So you are kind of doing this to some degree, whether you're explicitly mixing Clojure and Scala and, you know, being really formal about it. I think you're, you're kind of implicitly doing it just by the nature of modern software development. You know, it naturally kind of falls into special purpose things, uh, like SQL, for example, is a good example of a you know, special purpose thing that everybody is perfectly fine with using that as a standard part of your project. Well, great. Um, so, yeah, I think we've definitely moved into the age of the polyglot. There aren't, you know, it's not I'm a .NET developer as much anymore. I'm a Java developer. It's a lot more different, but there's probably... I imagine still resistance, the idea of, you know, specialization being a good thing, don't want to be, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Have, yep, there, have you run across any downsides to polyglot programming? Yeah, there are certainly downsides. I mean, in, in any form of resume-driven development, you can get in big trouble. If you're just using it for the sake of using something different that's not really making good, uh, you know, it doesn't make good sense, you just want to try something new. So there are certainly dangers here. But the people who are afraid of this, I would ask them when they say, you know, using this new language is too dangerous, I would ask them to replace the word language with framework and ask if the same question is still quite so terrifying. Because in many ways, learning a brand new complex framework like Spring is similar to learning a new language. It has its own semantics and its own rules and all the things that work in context. So I think that just with the same level of trepidation you would take on a new complex framework, like a new web framework, that's the same level of caution you should take on if you're implementing something in a brand new language. But you look at, you know, it's always, we try to be very pragmatic in our engineering decisions, so it, there's always this cost-benefit trade-off. Actually, learning new languages is much less costly than most people think because developers are used to learning new languages because we do that all the time. Um, and so, you know, we try to look at the trade-off to say, uh, is this, you know, the, a little bit of time hit up front, or are we going to save that time later on because we're using something that's much more effective and much closer to the problem we're trying to solve? So I think there are certainly dangers here. You can certainly, want, you know, use the wrong language for the right job. There's nothing that says that using multiple languages is automatically going to make you more productive or make things better. You are adding purposeful complexity to your code base to do that, so there has to be a good justification for doing that. So as long as you go into it with your eyes open and understand uh, what kind of footprint it's going to put on your project and what kind of ramp up time and those kind of constraints that you have, I think that you can use this very intelligently. Uh, we've done this on lots of projects where um, we've uh, mixed and matched uh, different languages to solve different problems, and there was a little bit of trepidation at first, but we've always tried to show that we are actually getting benefit from doing that. And so I think that's important to be pragmatic about it and don't fall into uh, the resume of development trap. Well, great. Um, and that sort of leads into another question I have for you about, you know, novice programmers or people who are interested in polyglot programming but, you know, might have questions about it, you know, do you have any advice or best practices when, you know, starting out? I think it's important to pick your platform, whichever it is. You can do this on lots of different platforms around the world. So Java obviously has more than 200 languages that run on it. The .NET ecosystem is designed for multiple languages, and while, ironically enough, they don't have as many on the .NET ecosystem, that's still a great place to play with uh, what-if games. If you're going to do this, I would tend to want to experiment with languages that don't particularly look like one another. So if you're in the Java world and switch to Groovy, it's almost cheating. You're almost not even using a different language because they're so similar to one another. Uh, to really get a huge advantage of switching to something as fundamental as a new programming language, it really needs to be something that supports 
a paradigm that's not well supported in the language you're in. So maybe use something like Erlang. There's a, 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 a an Erlang that runs on the JVM, and it's all messaging. It has a very unusual concurrency model, or a Scala mm -hmm. with the actor model for concurrency or closure for the software transaction memory. So I think it's probably wisest to, to not pick something that's close to what you already know and pick something that has uh, very dis de definitively different kinds of technical characteristics and particularly ones that are leaning toward a problem you're trying to solve. And that gets back to the don't do resume driven development advice from before. <laughs> So where do you see polyglot programming going in the future? I think it's going to keep uh, a, a pace with what's happening now. In fact, the latest kind of incarnation of this is one that kind of surprised me. You were asking me earlier if there were any surprises of how that manifests. And one of the ways it's really surprised me in the way it's manifest is that how pervasive JavaScript has become in all these unusual places. Because what people have figured out is that JavaScript, it turns out, is the true write once run anywhere language because it runs on phones and computers and browsers and all those other places. So we're seeing projects, people who were firmly ensconced on the back end and never had to worry about messy JavaScript are now having to deal with it because now people are writing frameworks that the way that you get flexibility across all these devices is build workflow and business logic in JavaScript and then run it on whatever platform is suitable, whether it's mobile or a server-side application or something like that. So we're actually seeing now JavaScript being embedded in lots of places as kind of a business rules language because it's the only one that runs on absolutely every stinking platform that it has to run on. So embedding JavaScript like that I think is going to become more and more popular out of the world. I think another interesting aspect of this is that this idea of polyglot programming frees you to use languages as almost the assembly language of themselves. So one of the things I said about Java was that Java language will become the assembly language of the Java platform. That mostly you work in languages that are a higher level, but occasionally you need to drop down to the low level Java to get something done. People are starting to do this on top of JavaScript as well. Because JavaScript has some well-known warts and you know weird things that came about because of its hurried birth and all those other constraints. But now you see languages like CoffeeScript or ClojureScript that are using JavaScript as a compilation target. And so that's kind of polyglot in a way because you're building new languages on top of this existing platform or language so that you can leverage the reach of the platform without having to put up with some of the limitations that are inherent in the platform. I think that's a, a really clever use. I think we're going to see more and more of that, particularly around JavaScript, uh, just because of the nature of how it works. Great. So do you have any um, resources you recommend for sort of keeping up on trends, or how do you, you know, keep up with what you see coming in terms of languages and new technologies? Well, certainly having a blog dedicated to this is going to be a good idea, because there are not a lot of resources out in the world that specifically address this. Um, Mostly information like this comes through individual language blogs uh, or resources. So I'm uh, writing an article series right now for uh, developer works called Java.next. And so I'm very plugged into the Scala, Clojure, and Groovy communities because of that. So I tend to get a lot of news from those communities in that way. Uh, I think probably it's impractical to think that you could be effective in more than a dozen different languages, particularly general purpose languages. And so you're probably best to pick a few and try to do kind of a deep dive in those and make sure that they are solving some particular problem you have and then try to keep track of those communities. And like I said, it's quite rare to find a resource that spans this entire subject area. And there were some attempts a few years ago for someone to write a book about this subject, but I never did see it come about. So it either came out and I didn't notice it or it just never came out. So uh, there's still a paucity of resources out in the world, but I'm hoping that as this becomes more and more common, that it's going to become a more common topic. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been really informative, and I'm interested to hear about how our readers are using polyglot programming as well. So thank yeah, you. Thanks very much for having me. I enjoyed it.